Pastor Terry, uh, I forgot that he didn't know what song we were going to sing, so he had to find it after we started. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, let's sing in loving kindness, Jesus came, number 426. <clears throat> Four hundred twenty six. <clears throat> Yeah. 
please, to Romans chapter 1. In just a little while, we'll begin reading with the 14th verse. Beginning two messages ago, I want to just refresh you just a little, and some of you don't know what I preached because you were not here. Two services ago, the subject was entitled CPR Training. <coughs> CPR Training. It was not cardiopulmonary resuscitation, but it had to do with character, privilege, responsibility of God's children. In that message, the Bible says, not the preacher, but the Bible. The Bible says that those who love Christ will obey Him, and those who do not love Him will not obey Him. Okay. And the one previous to this one was entitled, God Judges Sin. God will judge the unsaved man's sin in hell forever. But he also judges sin in this life. Lost men reap in this life. Saved men reap in this life from their sin and their disobedience to God. I have a request for you tonight. It's almost impossible to do, but I want you to do something for me. Most of you understand that God is totally sovereign, but I'd like for you to just forget that for a little while and go back to that word called human responsibility ignore sovereignty forget about it tonight but if you take up the responsibility about which I'll speak tonight it will be because of the sovereignty of God alright read with me if you will in Romans 1 verse 14 Paul said, I am debtor. Not I used to be, not I will be. I am debtor. Both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. To show you that men are responsible before God, whether they've ever even heard the gospel or not. You read these verses now. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. 
For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now look in verse 14 before I give you the subject. Paul said, I am debtor. I'm a debtor. Where debtor means you're under obligation. Probably some of you have said to a wife or a husband, we have a debt that we must write a check for tomorrow. The word debtor means then not only under obligation, but I had a, a surprise when I checked this word in a concordance. I found two little words in there that really caught my attention. It's the word should and ought. Paul said, I am a debtor. I ought to be a debtor. I ought to take the gospel. I should be a debtor. I should take the gospel. I'm under obligation to take the gospel. Very strange title tonight, but I think you'll get it before we're through. How to get out of debt. Paul said, I'm a debtor. I'm not talking about how to get out of debt in your finances, although I know a little bit about that. How to get out of debt. I want to give you three things to say about getting out of this spiritual debt. One is make sure you're saved. Be sure of that. If you want to get out of debt to God, make sure you're saved. Secondly, take the gospel to every creature, every place that you go. Now I realize there's sometimes as you go into a store... You go into some, some place, grocery store, whatever it is, that you can't stop everybody in there and preach to them. I understand that. But I want to go a little bit beyond taking the gospel to the lost. I believe God tells us, take the gospel to the lost until we die. But that's not the end of it. I believe God would be pleased with us if we left something behind and we designated that that be used for the sending of the gospel to sinners all over the world after we've gone to heaven. Now let's turn to Mark chapter 16 for a moment. Mark chapter 16. Paul's statement in Romans 1.14 is the whole foundation of everything that I'll say tonight. As I look about tonight, nearly all of you are a part of a missionary Baptist church someplace. And I personally believe that everything that I say is directed to you as an individual if you're saved, but directed to us as members of a Baptist church. Read the 14th verse. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. And he upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now he had to rebuke them some. The next two verses are of major importance. This is before we read it. This man I told you about who was baptized here this afternoon. Been God's child for many, many years. And all of a sudden he comes under the ministry of Brother Bobby Lakes. And he begins to hear about something called scriptural baptism. Not just any kind. Brother Lakes put him under the water, brought him up out of the water. And he dressed and he came out here. 
Some of the people that had come for the baptismal service came to shake hands with him. I heard him say more than once. He said, I'm a part of you all now. That sounds good to my ears. I'm a part. Oh, he's already God's child, already in the kingdom, already in God's family. But he wasn't a Baptist until God made him one. All right, having told you that, now 15, 16 year in Mark. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now let me say something about this. They didn't have an automobile. Probably they didn't even own a donkey. Didn't have an airplane. Didn't have a helicopter. Didn't have printing press. Didn't have any tracks. And God said to them, go into all the world and take the gospel to every creature. Why, Lord? Here it is. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. When he believes, his soul is saved. And when he goes down into the waters of baptism and he becomes a member of a missionary Baptist church, God will begin to save his life. So you get a twofold saving. But God said, He that believeth not shall be damned. Is that a reason for us to go try to get out of debt to God? I believe it is. Now here's, I, I, I don't want to embarrass any of you, but I am going to ask you a question momentarily. There is no sense in which anyone that's saved by the grace of God will deny what I'm getting ready to say. But you and this preacher are under God obligation. We are in debt to God as much as lies within us to see that men every place hear the gospel. <coughs> All right, having said that, what I want to know how many members of Grace Baptist Church believes that Mark 16 and verse 15 that God meant you? Let me see your hand if you think he meant you. Well, most of you put your hands up and you might as well put them up because when you came down that aisle and said Jesus is my Savior and my Lord and went in the waters of baptism, that obligation to send that gospel to every creature fell on you as though you were the only person in the world. You say, well, preacher, I don't know how to talk to people. I'm afraid to talk to them. You know what God's answer is? Learn how to talk to them. Get yourself in Sunday school. Get your Bible and begin to read it and study it. Get the tracts. Get the books. Get the book. Get it in your mind. And get it in the heart. I'm convinced tonight as pastor of this church that the reason some of you don't talk to lost souls is because you're afraid you don't know how to talk to them. We've been studying for three weeks down in the Sunday school class about how to witness to people that are lost. All right, Genesis chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. <coughs> We're going to read here about a man named Cain. But before we read it, it may shock you, but Cain was not his brother's keeper. Verse 8. Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass. They were in the field. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. The Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? What's the word keeper mean? Remember debtor in Romans 1, 14, you know what the word keeper means? Guard, protect, observe, watch, attend to. No, I don't personally believe that Cain was his brother's keeper, but I believe that every last one of us, or uh, that we are our brother's and sister's keeper. 
And not only that, not only are we to care about each other, but we're to care about lost souls. Listen to me. A man who's lost, do we believe he's blind and spiritually dead and can't care about himself? We better believe that because that's where he is. All saved persons, I'm going to keep saying it through this message, all saved persons are keepers and debtors. Now who are we in debt to? Be easy to remember. Friends, family, foes. We're in debt to every human being that we meet in this life. Now, God's answer is in our text, Romans 1, 14. We're debtor. Now, I want to deal with something else here, and I'm, I may well be just a little bit offensive tonight. Maybe I won't. Do you have a friend tonight? Do you have somebody that you really care deeply about? A real friend you say, this is my best friend. It may be a girl, it may be a boy, it may be a man, it may be a woman. You say, I really love this friend. But you know them to be lost without hope and you have not once told them about their need of Christ. I must say to you and to myself that we're not a friend to that person. How could I call myself a friend? Let me ask you something. If your next door neighbor's house was on fire in the middle of the night, would you go over and tell them? Every last one of us would run as fast as our legs would carry us and we would cry and we'd beat on the door. We'd beg them to rise from your sleep. The house is on fire. You're perishing. That wouldn't be nearly as important as plucking a brand from the burning. You know what I thought when I began to see just a little bit of this again? I thought probably, Lord, almost all of us are guilty in that we have somebody that we see on a regular basis and we know them to be lost and we haven't opened our mouths one single time. And we say, oh, this is my friend. Not so. Not so. To say I'm a friend to a person and ignore their eternal destiny, their need of a Savior. Listen, there are people tonight that are going to die in America and go out into eternity who never once heard about Jesus who don't even know there is a place called hell. They don't even know it. You say you couldn't live in America. There's Bibles on every shelf and there's, there's church buildings on every corner. There's a lot of difference in hearing the word and really knowing there's a hell. How could I call myself a friend to people that I see who are lost? I couldn't unless... I'm going to give you three unlesses. The only way I can say that I'm a friend to somebody and I've not told them about Christ, here's the only way. Unless I do not believe that God puts them in hell forever. Maybe I don't believe that. Or unless I think maybe that, like one of the professors at the seminary in Louisville said, he believed they hadn't heard the gospel to get a second chance after they die. But this book said when they die, they go to hell and they stay in hell. You remember a rich man that died? He, he wanted, wanted somebody to come over and put a little water on his tongue. And Abraham had to say to him, there's a great gulf fixed and you can't go from one to the other. And that's why you know there is no such place as purgatory. There's no such thing as a second chance after death. It doesn't exist. 
How could I call myself a friend? Or here's the one that gets some of us. Unless I hold to the fact they're God's elect and he'll send somebody to them. Boy, if we've got any, if we've got any in this audience tonight, I, wanna, I want you to know I'm talking directly to you. Do you believe in election so strong that you say, well, God chose them. He'll get the job done. But I'm going to tell you something. He told you to do it. He told me to do it. Didn't he? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, God said it pleased him by the foolishness of preaching to save those that want to believe. And how can they believe without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they're sent? And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God according to the Bible. I don't personally believe anybody's ever been saved without somebody preaching to them. Adam and Eve got saved, I believe, and I know somebody preached to them, his name was God. But when the Lord Jesus went back to heaven, he said to these missionary Baptist churches, his kind of church, the kind he built, the kind he promised per perpetuity, you know something? There's nobody ever lived on this earth in the last 2,000 years that's as responsible as missionary Baptist people. The others don't have the authority. The others don't have the responsibility of taking the gospel, although I must say to you, I believe every saved person, whether he's Baptist or something else, owes the gospel to every person that he sees. You're in debt then, and I'm in debt. Now I want to spend the, the next 10 minutes or so, whatever time that, that I take here, talking about who we're in debt to. Certainly goes without saying that the first debt that we owe is to the unsaved, lost, hell-deserving, spiritually blind, spiritually dead sinners. In America today, as well as other places in the world, there has come a national concern over many different things over the homeless do you go home at night and, and eat a good meal and lie down upon the bed and pass a homeless man on the way to your home and do it with ease I don't and then there's the helpless that some are concerned about I'm going to call his name out loud because he was a champion of the liberal side on the Supreme Court. Justice Brennan has retired from the court, but he is the one who was so adamant against cruel punishment in that he opposed capital punishment for those guilty of crimes, but he turned around and was the propagator of this role against Wade thing in 1973 where they killed helpless babies every day. But there's a concern over the helpless. There's a concern on the part of some over the elderly, over the economy, over the air and the water, and over the garbage. You remember the little girl down in Texas who fell down a, a, a well? That became a national concern. Prayers were offered from 48 or 50 states. Dan Rather would come on the news at night and say they don't have her out. There were reporters from all over that stood around and gave progress reports. People sent money. People sent toy. You say you see anything wrong with that? I don't. But my brothers and sisters, they were working to, to save a little girl down in the bottom of a well. And all around them, souls were dying without Christ, going out into eternity, and nobody cared. Baptists are warped. Say, preacher, you sound like uh, you didn't want to see the little girl rescued. Oh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. But it seems to me today that so few understand, so few care, so few are going to tell the old, old story. So many procrastinations are, 
or procrastinators are going to give answer to God. I wonder sometimes. I've slowed down a little bit. I can't run as fast as I used to. And if I had to grade my ministry tonight, and I don't get to grade it because God's going to grade it, but if I had to grade it, you know where, where I fail probably the most is preaching messages like this and pleading with you as individuals. We have the money here. You're helping now 45 or 50 men in varying amounts. We're sending our papers, Brother Jay. We're sending the radio broadcast. I met a man today for the first time, said, I listened to the radio broadcast. The telecast is on at least part of the time and hopefully more regularly. And I believe that many of you witness when you can. But we've only scratched the surface. I don't know whether it's possible that we've got secret sin in this church body and only God and the person knows about it or not. But I know this, a Baptist church doing business for God. You remember what Brother Kirkman said down in the basement? Lord, would you come down and let Scott County know you're doing business on this corner? I'm saying to you, we ought to be reaching some souls. You say, I thought you believed in election predestination. I do. But I'll tell you this, God gives his children the privilege of being a witness. And if you'll keep talking, sooner or later, somebody's going to hear. You just keep talking. And you'll find that it'll happen. We Baptists, and I'm going, to, I said earlier I was going to offend. I'm getting ready to offend one or two or six of you. Not on purpose. But we Baptists are in debt to Protestants and Catholics and cults to make sure they've heard the gospel of grace and then to make sure that if the opportunity is there, the door is open to tell them that the Lord Jesus started his kind of church during his ministry and it's been here for 2,000 years and that kind of church is the one that has authority to preach and baptize and teach and if you're not a part of that kind if you're saved you still go to heaven but you can't give glory to God outside the church like you could inside the Lord Jesus put inside his church body the two ordinances of the Lord's Supper and baptism and they've never been any place else I sat on that front pew this afternoon and watched that man and he raised his hand and he said the words similar to what I would say and he said by the authority of the Faith Baptist Church First Sales Kentucky I baptize you by the authority of the Lord Jesus who's the head of each local church. And then we Baptists are in debt to our brothers and sisters in this church body. You may be in debt to any Baptist brother or sister. You know what Hebrews 10 says? And I can promise you all something ahead of time because the Bible says whatever we sow that shall we reap. You that are skipping Sunday school, you that skip Wednesday night, you that skip Sunday nights, you that lay in bed on Sunday morning sometime, you're teaching your children that God and the church and the word of God is not first in your life and you'll live to regret that someday down the road. If you live long enough to hear a child or a grandchild tell you, I don't have any interest in the things of God, don't look at others. Look in the mirror like I've had to do and say, Lord, did I fail them? I didn't fail to speak, but did I fail to walk where they could see something? See, this is not just to you, this is to me. We're in debt to our brothers and sisters. We're in debt. I thank God for, that I'm able to say this. Many of you pray for your pastor in your church every day. Many of you do that. The men in the prayer room, the men up here, they pray that others will hold up pastor's hand. 
See, I've already admitted to you that I can't go as fast as I used to. I can put in as many hours, but I can't run as fast as I used to. And that's why I need all the help that the Lord will give. And that's why I thank God every day that many of you are walking with us and working with us in various ways. All through the book of Ephesians, Paul talked about praying daily for all the saints. We Baptists are in debt to our brothers and sisters to try to recover them from unconcern. Listen, I hear this a lot and I use it. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know this. When your brother or your sister forsakes God's house on a regular basis, there's something wrong. Something wrong in the home, something wrong in the heart. There's something wrong, and they need to be helped. They expect the pastor to check on them. But, oh, it's more effective sometimes when a brother or sister says, I missed you. I missed you and want you to know that I loved you. We need to try that. You know what it said in Galatians chapter 6? If a brother be overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual, go to him. Turn there for a minute. Galatians chapter 6. This thing of being a friend to people not only fits with the lost, but it fits with those who claim the name of Christ. Brethren, in verse 1, Galatians 6, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such as one. That means mend his broken bones. Brother Ronnie, if your wife or children broke a leg tonight, would you take them to the doctor? I appreciate you doing that, and I imagine they would too. Well, in the spiritual realm, God is using the same connotation. He's saying, if you see your brother or sister overtaken in a fall, go to them, bind them up, mend their bones, get them back on the solid rock, get them back on the right track. Look what else he said. Verse 2, I have known a few people in my lifetime, not many of them here, maybe none of them here now, but who, had, who held the position, Jesus is my Savior, I'm a member of a Baptist church, and I don't owe anybody anything. But they haven't understood. You owe the gospel, but you owe this thing of being your brother and sister's keeper to those that are part of the body. Now look what he said, verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ has to do with love for God and love for the saints of God. We're dead to all men, my brothers and sisters. My subject tonight was how to get out of debt, but I'm not sorry to have to tell you this, but you can't get out. Did you know when you get to heaven and walk on streets of gold and have a glorified, resurrected body, you'll still be in death. And every time you see the nail prints in his hands and in his feet and the spear marks in his side, when you've been there 10,000 years, no less days to sing God's praise, but that'll be a constant reminder to us. Jesus paid it all. I close with this remark. You can't get out of debt, but you can try. You can't get out of debt, but you can try. And I realize full well something I said Wednesday night and this morning, that we live in a stressful world. And I thank God for those that, that work jobs and put in long hours and pay your tithes and give an offering when you can and take care of your family. Did you ever pick up a newspaper and the, the lead article said, I'll tell you a story about Bill Jones. Bill goes to work every day, gives them an honest day's work. Bill takes his paycheck and goes home takes care of his wife and his children. He takes his family to church and he reads them the Bible. 
and he's a good neighbor and he keeps the laws did you ever see Bill's name in the paper he never will what's in the paper is what men are doing most of the time contrary to the, the book of God I didn't bring this out this morning but this came out of the men's prayer meeting tonight as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be in the coming of the son of man when you go back to Genesis and read violence was every place and if you can go home tonight in Scott County, Fayette County, Harrison County Bourbon County, wherever you go you can go home and lay down with reasonable safety you ought to thank God because those days are coming to a close but Jesus may come before morning would you go if he blew the trump tonight and if he did blow the trump tonight and we, uh, we had to start giving account of him one thing he's going to say he's going to say you Baptist I told you to go and take the gospel to every creature and we, we're going to give answer to him what are we going to say lost person what would you say You'd have to stay behind tonight if Jesus came. Wasn't there an old song that said something about the family circle? Will it be unbroken? Not unless we take the gospel. How'd you like to see your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren, your moms, your dad, your brother, your sister, or somebody, husband or wife, stand at that lost man's judgment? You say, oh, what a terrible thing. Thank God he'll wipe away the tears. And he's not going to lose any. We go back to sovereignty just for that moment. He's going to get them. But I'll tell you, Brother Jerry, you don't know who the elect are, and it's your job to take the gospel to every creature and the rest of us. May we stand for prayer.